Discussion of current events in the nation and around the world and how they affect the people of Indiana. Here's your moderator, Larry Long. Hindsight and foresight. You will get a little of each today on Public Affairs Roundtable. We'll review 1985 in Indiana, what it meant for Hoosiers, and we'll gaze into the crystal ball at 1986 and let you know what might be in store for you if, if you're an Indiana citizen. Our reviewers and prognosticators on today's Public Affairs Roundtable are Ball State University professors Bill Mosier from Marketing, Cecil Bohannon, from economics, and John Rouse from the Department of Political Science. John, uh, the Indiana legislature, first three months of the year, gave us some fairly significant legislation, uh, something that we're going to be going to be with us for a while. Uh, Larry, uh, first of all, let's emphasize that anything that comes out of the legislature is a change at the margins. You don't expect tremendous, uh, drastic change. The three or four things that I think that were very important in terms of marginal change were these. First of all, safety belt legislation. Uh, by July 1 of 87, everyone is mandated to wear a safety belt. Secondly, drunk driving. This was a big issue. So there is a stricter requirement for sobriety for having uh, sober drivers. The third issue is the abolishment of, of the happy hour concept. So happy hours uh, has been done away with. And finally, there has been a boost in, in terms of taxation, in, in, in terms of what we can uh, uh, deduct from our gross income. So that is a, uh, a progressive thing in terms of allowing more freedom as far as taxation. So I think these are the marginal issues. Uh, as we look at the legislature, we have to keep in mind that the past, one, the, uh, the past legislature was the one of the long session. Uh, there were some 372 new laws passed, uh, as there were 23.8 percent of the laws proposed were indeed passed. So that's a quick summary in terms of the general focus, in terms of marginal change, and the issues that are important. Some emotional issues, some personal issues, you talk about seatbelt legislation, but the happy hours, the drunk driving legislation, some very emotional, personal issues where government's stepping in and saying, wait a minute, we can set some standards here in terms of drunk driving, uh, and even in terms of the fact that you'll have to wear seat belts. Uh, intrusion? Well, yes, and, and I think our society really has to deal with what is the proper role of the state. As we look at the issues of gambling or drunk driving or even license branch reform, and certainly education, we have to look at what is going to be the role of the state. Mm -hmm. How much intervention in the personal lives does the state go? Well, I think that's the, the issue. Doesn't it seem like what you said in terms of the important issues is they've essentially been traffic related. Most of the alcohol related issues, the reason, the upbeat as to why we're getting that kind of legislation is because people don't like to see other people being slaughtered on the highways because of drugs. Now the same thing's happening with seatbelt legislation, but aren't, aren't they really two separate issues? And doesn't that sort of tell us the way legislators approach issues? They tend to have a shotgun approach. Do everything we can to uh, lower traffic fatalities now independent of whether or not personal rights are infringed upon. Obviously, if someone drives down the road and they've had too much to drink, they're very directly infringing upon the rights of other people to drive on the road safely. However, if you don't choose to put a seatbelt on because you like the free flow of the wind in your convertible, isn't that a very different kind of thing? Yeah, see, see, cars are the best way that we express our freedom in this country. And legislatures respond to crisis management, and they also respond to interest groups. Basically, interest groups uh, lobby and interest groups uh, really combine three things. You talk about brain power and numbers and organization and money. So the people that are concerned about uh, driving and, and uh, drunk driving, they're the ones that have lobbied to get their way in the past legislature. Don't you find that ironic, though, John, that, that, that has been addressing the issue of uh, safety on the highway and all this sort of thing? It seems all these things, as we are talking about now, seem to be really directed to this one area, concentrated in auto safety and, and individual safety in the car. And yet, actually, the uh, situation with the lower uh, speed limit, uh, as far as the injuries and accidents, is actually not higher than it was. In fact, it's probably down a little bit. Uh, so. It says, I guess what I'm saying is, it says that these lobbying groups are even more successful because they have, despite the 
better situation as far as safety, they were successful in getting the legislature to respond. So it really is a powerfully emotional issue, I guess is what I'm well, saying. Well, it's, it's an issue, uh, Bill, that you know better than I, and, and, and that's the issue of consumerism. Mm -hmm. And uh, as these consumer groups uh, uh, attempt to try to get their way. I, I think you're exactly right on the, the consumer issues and the people that uh, get the publicity when, for example, if there is something that uh, a particular type of a, a major lawsuit that's involved or this sort of thing, then it gets a lot of people rallying behind. Uh, and it's, it's really interesting how there's been a tremendous amount of back and forth uh, wrangling between the automotive companies and the government in state governments as well as federal in terms of this seat belt issue. In other words, there's, there's been a continuing back and forth process where they've fought this thing and, uh, the, and on a related note, the airbag sort of a thing. So it's something that, uh, it's interesting to me that it happened in Indiana. They did go with the seat belt thing, despite the fact that there is a certain amount of, uh, yeah, and, and, I guess, Midwest and, conservatism about yeah. the uh, reluctance to do and these the, things. The, the other thing we could say is that this is not, I mean, all of these issues are ones of political consensus. In other words, Republicans and Democrats really don't disagree all that much about seat belts or about drunk driving. It's it's difficult to be against these kinds of issues. Right, being for traffic safety is like being for motherhood. Yeah. How can you possibly object to that? And whatever minor infringement occurs on the individual's freedom with respect to whether he can put the seat belt on or not, uh, the other side can always allude to the fact, well, traffic accidents are going to go down. Look how many lives are going to be saved. And what legislator is going to vote against that? Yeah. 86 session promises to be not as productive as the 85 session, in large part because we're working with 60 working days instead of 90 working days. And also 86 is not the budget making year and, and apparently the state does not have a lot of extra money to spend in, uh, with a budget supplement. So what do we look for in, in the short 86 session? Well, I, I think these are the issues. Uh, first of all, the Uniform Marital Property Act. Basically, this is a very controversial issue and it hits a lot of us. It, uh, in Indiana, there is no protection for the spouse in terms of what the will says. And this one is going to be a very controversial issue. Another issue is going to be the reform of public welfare. There's been a real problem in Gary, Indiana, and Lake County in terms of poor relief. A third issue is one that also focuses upon the consumerism, it, the consumerism issue, and that is nursing home regulations. Mm -hmm. And that also affects society in a very broad kind of way. Ones that have been brought up in the past that we know a lot about, or at least have heard a lot about, is the issue of the lottery. And that again focuses upon the role of the state. Uh, another issue is the issue that we've heard about in terms of politics, license branch reform. In other words, what's going to be the efficiency record of, of agencies that deal things like highway administration or the license branch administration. Again, we get back to the issue of freedom and cars and so forth. A final issue that, uh, that would, would also be dealt with is the issues of uh, the environmental issues, uh, toxic waste, landfills. Uh, these are some of the issues. A lot of leftovers. I mean, these things come up session after session. These are just things the legislature, to this point, have not, has not dealt with. Yeah, yeah and, and, and I should emphasize perhaps maybe the uh, several factors. First of all, as you say, Larry, there is not much money to be spent. And we look at other kinds of concerns that might be of concern. The farms. Farming, of course, is a very big issue in this state. As I said, the issue of poor relief, that's an important issue. And also, a final issue is one of public liability insurance. In other words, what's going to be the liability of the state or the city or the counties in terms of those kinds of activities? A broad brush, in a sense, but again, if there's going to be change in this area, we can expect only marginal change. Well, John, if in fact it's going to be change at the margin, if we hypothesize that's the way legislators operate, and they also operate in a system where they only respond when there's a crisis in place, and also we have a short session with a lot, a lot, a lot of funds, what would you think would be the primary issue that you'd bet the legislature would be most likely to address in some meaningful, significant way? Of all the ones that we've listed, which mm -hmm. one do you think is the most crisis-oriented that they would turn their attention to? The, that's a very good question. Um, I, I think uh, there are a couple ones. I'd say education is a long-range kind of one in terms of how do you deal with that issue. I'd also think that the issue of welfare is also important. 
welfare in the sense that uh, if we do not provide monies to those who do not have, they, in, in, at some point in time, become a, a threat to the middle class. Uh, so, so I would say that the issues that are most relevant to the middle class, these are going to be the issues that are, that are going yeah. to be of concern. Well, isn't the welfare reform problem, isn't that centered in one particular pocket of Indiana? Isn't that essentially a problem in Gary Hammond and in uh, what center township in Indianapolis? Well, yeah, I, I, think, I think that's where the symptom is, but I think the underlying cause mm. is, is across the state. Yeah, there have been problems throughout. Township trustees who have been trying to dole out some poor relief aid. It happens uh, in virtually every county, doesn't it? I mean, where you, uh, sometimes where you have this problem? Of course, it depends mm -hmm. on the economy, which is something we can get into here. One of the reasons the state is low on funds, uh, collections revenue is some $30, $40 million under expectations at this point. Generally, that's a reflection of the economy. Does that mean that uh, we're looking at bad economic times, Cecil? I don't know. The thing I find so interesting about the statistics I see in Indiana today is that the Indiana unemployment rate is approximately the same as the national rate. I think it's a very interesting statistic. Generally, you think of Indiana as being a capital good, uh, durable consumer good kind of uh, state. That's what it produces. And generally, you expect it to have a higher unemployment rate than the, than the rest of the nation. Nevertheless, the latest statistics shows Indiana unemployment being approximately the same as national average. And I'm sure if you factor out the Gary Hammond steel producing area, uh, the economy in Indiana seems to be very resilient. I really don't have a good explanation as to why it is revenues are down the way they are. Uh, Cecil, I think that's sort of interesting. I'm curious, uh, you, we you talk about it being very, very similar in Indiana as far as the, the unemployment rate and things of this nature. And I'm wondering whether part of it could be explained by the fact that we have in Indiana a tremendous uh, dynamic growth in Indianapolis. And Indianapolis sure. is not capital. It's really service-oriented. Sure. And so there, that's the offsetting factor. Precisely. Was the capital part of Indiana, the, ca the heavy industry. The heavy industry. And that is perhaps soft. is the explanation as to why it is that revenues have gone down, in that the revenue elasticity of the service industry probably isn't as high as the revenue mm -hmm. elasticity of durable goods industries, in that people that work in the service industry probably, on average, in Indiana make a little bit less than people that would work in the high-paid union jobs, say, in the auto factories in Anderson and Muncie. So revenues may be down for that particular reason. And, and the service industry is not as mature. In other words, it's that's going true. to That's true. And also, if you think about it in terms of local property taxes, property tax kind of base, uh, there's not as much to tax with the service industry as there is with an industrial complex. So it's not all surprising local revenues would be down by virtue of that. But I think it's very interesting just to see the resiliency of the state economy in the sense that uh, I don't think anyone would have expected two years ago when we had high unemployment and Indiana's unemployment rate was even higher than the national average, that by the time we came to, let's say, the middling point of the recovery, Indiana would have caught up with the rest of the nation. I think that's very surprising. I think your explanation of Indianapolis and a growing service industry is telling us something about where the state's going. It's also telling us, it's sort of an indicator, a barometer of the service sector, the service industry that's emerging nationwide. Now, Cecil, so, no. let me... Uh, uh, I've always referred to, uh, to Indianapolis as the Paris of Indiana. So in a sense, if uh, Indianapolis is the Paris of Indiana... So what's Sean Saylor Z? You're an idiot? Right. <laughs> uh, as if I, I, I can remember my question for you. Uh, if the same question you asked me, all right, where, what's going to be the focus in 86 in terms of what groups are going to uh, be affected? What groups are suffering? To answer my question, uh, the same question uh, that you sure. asked me, what groups are suffering economically uh, within the middle class? And I think that maybe can answer your question of a few minutes ago. As to what legislation is going to emerge. Well, sure. Right, right. Sure. I, mean, I mean, in the sense that, 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 can you tell us what particular economic, you know, what particular socioeconomic groups are suffering in terms of the economic rate? Well, again, I mean, I think the thing that I'm impressed with is not so much that there is, quote, suffering on the part of, I suppose, what we would call the high-plate, blue-collar industrial mm -hmm. class. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the one that's been hurt in the last five years sure. by virtue of uh, import competition, by virtue of a recession, by virtue of flight of capital from the north to the south. All those things have decreased employment opportunities in the traditional blue-collar sector of the state of Indiana. Uh, the high-paying UAW kinds of jobs that a lot of people have sort of banked on as a kind of career. I think the thing that's interesting, though, is it seems as though a lot of the people that traditionally would go into those kinds of jobs are very quickly 
finding the capacity to retrain themselves and enter into the new emerging service sector. Because obviously, if unemployment is remaining the same rate as it was before the recession, something's happened. And I suppose part of it's out migration. Right. Sure, a lot of people yeah, have and, moved. And, a lot of people have moved from Indianapolis or from Gary down to Smyrna, Tennessee, or wherever. Yeah. But it also seems to me that the net number of jobs that have been created in Indiana have been positive. That you do have small businesses that are emerging, entrepreneurship. Of course, this is a focal That's, point. This is a focal point of the whole or Mutz administration is exactly. that I think they really recognize that the growth of any particular area depends upon small business. This is not the kind of thing that you're going to see front headlines of the newspaper. But, but it's not a big, in other words, it's not like one big yeah. catch of a particular Yeah, you don't area. get a thousand new jobs. But, for example, I know of someone that's starting a bottled water service in the area. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's only producing three or four jobs. But nevertheless, those are jobs where displaced middle-class, blue-collar workers are going into the service sector. So it's, and, it's more of a grassroots approach to business sure, and, and sure. the fact that then you don't have one big one, that there might be a slowdown in, in a very large company situation. Right. As a result, you have huge, right. uh, a very large number of layoffs here. It's and, and again, if you just look at the bad news, if you look at the number of layoffs that have occurred, and you just look at the newspaper statistics, I hate to get on newsmen, but <laughs> if you get in the newspaper statistics and look at quote the quote number of jobs lost, you'd expect Indiana to be going down the cesspool from what we've seen the last three years in the newspaper. Now, now, but that, it hasn't because you have this small business sector that's resilient. I think this resilient this is what I refer to in terms of education could be the focus because not only education in terms of higher education, in terms of how does this state deal with the brain drain? And so education has to be a continuing oh, kind of right. focus. The second issue I looked at was the issue of welfare. Now welfare also refers to short-term welfare in terms of uh, economic dislocation, unemployment compensation, that kinds of things. As you have your blue collar people losing jobs, there's going to be a focus upon short term welfare, which also involves economic kinds of consideration. The growth of the small business, I see. So if we run into economic problems, is this, is this not somewhat fragile, though? Don't we have a high rate of, of loss in, among new small businesses starting, well, is it? I suppose that's always true, whether it's good times or bad times. What's the statistic? Well, you know that better than I would. Well, be. the one thing I was thinking about, uh, not too long ago, we were uh, in preparing for a program, I was looking at, actually, during the recession, you had an awful lot of businesses that were going bankrupt, but you had a tremendous number of small businesses being started right mm -hmm. during that. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a lot of... Uh, a lot of turnover, mm -hmm. but uh, there it's. I guess it's a case where everybody has. A, there's a lot of people who have a very high level of optimism, and they're willing to try it. They figure it, they can do it where somebody else can't. And so, yes, they're vulnerable. But seriously, it was the we we saw that there was a tremendous growth, the fastest, the most growth of small businesses during the recession That's that we've ever seen. Yeah, I think it's something, it's something parallel to the evolutionary process. It's not at all surprising to see eighty percent of all the, quote, experiments that go into business failing at some point or another. Just like it's not at all surprising to see most species, when they evolve, the mutations that emerge not working. But that doesn't say anything about the long-term capacity of the whole economic environment to support significant growth and change. I think, again, this is a national figure, but if you look at the Fortune 500 companies, the top 20 companies, in 1900 and compare it to the top 20 country companies in 1985, there's no resemblance at all. And if you just right. looked at the top right. 20 companies that declined, you would assume, and you only took that statistic, you'd assume economic activity between 1900 and 1985 went to zero. Mm -hmm. But again, I think the whole point is just as uh, the ecosystem is sometimes much more resilient than some people think it would be, uh, the, ec the economy is much more resilient because there's a lot of small participators that don't get the big press that sometimes... 85, the GMs and the 85 was not a bad year economically in Indiana. It no. uh, wasn't a great year, but uh, are we going to see more of the same in 86? Oh. Moderate growth. Uh, in fact, uh, no real peaks or valleys in the curve. Heavens no. Let me get the entrail of the goat to guess that one. <laughs> <laughs> My suspicion is that Indiana is more or less going to follow whatever national trends are. I mean, there's no way you can get out of the, that we live in a national market here in Indiana. There's no question of that. So I suppose that's going to depend upon whatever the economic forecast. The current wisdom now is, yeah, essentially what you said, that it's going to be moderate growth, moderate inflation, no real surprises. It, but then it, again, that's what Isn't there a real split from. among different economists uh, looking at this next year, though, in terms of, uh, in other words, there's, uh, I, I saw one, uh, program, or I was reading one thing that where there's some real difference of opinion on whether 86 is going to be good or whether it's really going to be a gradual but 
downward sort of a thing where some really see so, a recessionary trend. Yeah. 87, real, really the recession. The recession sitting in 87 and 86 is going to be sort of a moderate but year. But there's some real splits sure. among some people that have and, traditionally been sure. in agreement. And then there's a, another group that is really looking for the spectrum of inflation reemerging. And if inflation reemerges, then that, of course, is a whole different set of problems. Which is this tied in with the uh, with the uh, the dollar and this sort of thing? The efforts sure, to because control? sure because if the dollar ends up uh, going down in value, then imports are more expensive. That contributes to the inflation mm -hmm. rate, and also to the extent there's been very excessive monetary growth on the part of the Federal Reserve. Uh, a lot of economists, sort of the Milton Friedman vein, do forecast a certain degree of inflation, even though inflation is one statistic that's been remarkably stable, independent it seems as to what the Federal Reserve has done, which is surprising to many monetary economists. 86 will be different, John Rouse, in terms that uh, in Indiana we will have elections uh, statewide and at the top of the ticket, uh, Dan Quayle, United States Senator running for re-election. Uh, good year, bad year for Dan Quayle and Republicans? Uh, the answer quickly is that for the, really uh, for the first time in a long time the emphasis will be upon the quality of the candidates, and uh, both in this state and also elsewhere. As you say, this past year was not a political year. Every, every, every three out of four years we have an election in this state. Uh, I think the thing to look for in terms of state government in the next uh, 12 months or so, first of all, what's going to be the role of the Democratic Party? Uh, the Democrats only hold a, mar a, a, a 20 seats in the Senate. Republicans uh, are two-thirds uh, virtually almost in the Senate and certainly two-thirds when it comes to the House of Representatives, 61 to 39. The issue we can look for in the future, what is going to be the role of the Democratic Party as a, as a policymaker in this state? A second issue that we could look at is what's going to be the decision by the Supreme Court in terms of the gerrymandering issue of the multi-member district setup that we have here in Indiana. What has happened so far is that the accusation, the charge is that the state Republican Party uh, is not fair to the Democrats in terms of the setting up of the multi-member district. They, uh, the, these districts are set up to allow, supposedly, to allow Republicans to have an edge in terms of winning. So I would say those two issues are the issues that we look at in 86. Uh, the gerrymandering issue has not been yet defined. And, of course, what is going to be the role of the Democratic Party in this state? Well, you're asking questions. We're looking for answers here today, John. <laughs> yeah. uh, the Democrats are looking for a leader, looking for a hero. And right now they don't even have a candidate to run against Dan Quayle. Yeah, well, well, of course, the Democrats uh, uh, had, have suffered from a, several things. First of all, they have a lack of good people in terms of coming up through the ranks. They also suffer from a lack of money. Uh, I, I, I think they face very tough times here in Indiana. Well, isn't one of their potential uh, Democratic heroes, so to speak, wouldn't Phil Sharp fill that role fairly well? And if he was, were, were quite gerrymandered out of his district, which I understand is one of the proposals, one of the things that possibly well, can happen, what's the likelihood of that happening? What's I, the likelihood I don't, I don't of think it's going to happen because the Supreme Court has stayed this particular issue. And it's not likely that they will make a decision very soon and say, well, you have to change all these districts, and then everybody gets all upset. Uh, the Republicans, or at least some Republicans, like the way it is. For example, Dan Burton likes the fact that he has a 65% Republican uh, setup in his district. So I think it's extremely unlikely that the Supreme Court will make a decision whereby that these districts will have to be all changed around. Keep in mm -hmm. mind, we have the primaries coming up mm -hmm. in May. So I, I, th I think that's unlikely. I think it's therefore very unlikely that Phil Sharp's going to run statewide against the uh, Quayle. So essentially, even if you don't love Quayle, Quayle hasn't done anything that makes anybody hate him, so it looks like he's in for another six well, years. Well, I, I, you know, uh, this is basically a national kind of focus, but I think what we're finding around the country is that you're going to have 34 independent Senate races in 86. And although political parties are very important in terms of the past, we look at 62 and 66 and 78 in terms of the Democrats, in terms of how many seats are lost in the, in the House of Representatives. And as far as Republicans are concerned, we look at 1974 and we look at uh, 1982 as decreasing years. Uh, and, and there are 16 new Republicans coming up 
Uh, but, but, but you have to look at the quality of the candidates. And so far, uh, there's no indication in terms of a, a quality candidate with a statewide name running against Dan Quayle in 86. Traditionally, it's n not a good year for the president's party in this midterm right, election. Yeah. Uh, what you're saying is it's that... It's going to be a far, far less impact. A, a little bit disorganization on behalf of Democrats, a lack of money, a lack of... of a lack of well, a, a, yeah. a, a, a basically a lack of an ideological focus. Sure. I mean, it's it's basically Me Tooism. Uh, and, and so... Do you think more so in Indiana than, say, in some of the East Coast states? or? Well... No, no, not necessarily. But, 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 but keep in mind that the base of the Republican Party in Indiana is as strong as any place in the mm -hmm. country. And mm -hmm. getting back to the Paris so really of Indiana, to to, <laughs> which is Indianapolis, I mean, that's where the strength is. Mm -hmm. That's where it's been ever since Unigov was passed in 1969. So you have a structural base for the Republican Party as well as a political base. So whether you're looking at the multi-member districts, that's a structural kind of concern as well as the setup in terms of the strength of the Paris of Indiana versus the rest of the state. So what we're going to look at then probably in 86 is status quo, where Democrats are not going to win the legislature, the House or the Senate. No, 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 no. We're it's looking at status very... quo, but, but the theme of this program, I guess, in a sense, is indeed marginal change. And uh, even if you have a change in the structure, the structure is not going to change for another two years or four years or how many years? For the result is. Okay. Folks, there you have it. You can jot it down, uh, save it for a year, and uh, pick us up uh, and see how well it's liable. <laughs> yeah, the, no, no liability. Here. Not necessarily express the opinions of Ball State University or anybody else for that matter. <laughs> I'd like to thank our uh, guests, uh, Cecil Bohannon, Bill Mosier, and John Rouse, for their guesstimates here today. I'm Larry Law. Thank you for joining us. If you have comments regarding this program, please address them to John Rouse, Box 149, Muncie, Indiana, 47305. The producer for Public Affairs Roundtable is John Rouse. Associate producers are Cecil Bohannon and Bill Mosier. This program is a production of University Media Services, the Department of Political Science, and radio and television stations on the campus of Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana.